All right, so, um, I mean, Solid is a, is a design principle. It was first written by uh, Robert C. Martin, sometimes known as Uncle Bob. He uh, wrote a book about this, I believe, back in uh, 2000 or so. Uh, then he did another iteration of it, per, uh, in particular for C Sharp. So if you've worked in multiple languages, you may have heard about this before, may know a little bit of it. Uh, but in PHP, for example, um, I mean, it is, it technically supports uh, objects and classes, but at its core, it doesn't force you to be object-oriented. So there's probably a lot of PHP developers who have never actually done true object-oriented design or know the principles behind it. So um, there's actually some really good things in here uh, that I, I like to take to heart that really helps you make more modular, reusable code and easier to support in the long term. Uh, by the way, if you want to look more into Robert C. Martin, you can also look at, uh, he's also known as Uncle Bob for uh, a lot of his different presentations that he does. Uh, he has a website in an LLC called Clean Coders, as well as Bob, you know, Bob Consulting, if I remember correctly. Uh, definitely something to look into. So first of all, like, uh, what does SOLID stand for? Uh, but the S is single responsibility. Uh, open close principle, and I'll go into these on each individual slide. Uh, Liskov substitution principle, interface segregation, and uh, dependency inversion principle. Uh, sounds pretty abstract, like it's not, you don't really get a lot of information from the individual one, so I'll definitely have to kind of break it down by its individual responsibilities. But first of all, single responsibility principle. Uh, a class should have one and only one reason to change, meaning that a class should have only one job. Uh, and this is where you see a lot of development where you'll, you'll see a class that has many different uh, properties inside of it and, or methods that uh, sometimes you'll say, it's like, I don't know if that's truly the responsibility of, of this object. Um, and you'll see a lot where it will be pseudo-related, but not fully related. One example that you might see in a lot of different code bases is um, like shopping cart, where I'll also have like shipping or tax. And because in a way it is related to the shopping cart, but you know, you're, it's different variables that could change at, at any given time, regardless of the items that are inside of the shopping cart. Uh, so when you see that, that's normally where you're adding too much responsibility and creating more inline code rather than modular little snippets that you can reuse. So it sounds pretty simple in principle, um, but uh, also like, like anything simple, it actually is really hard to maintain and keep. Um, so the example that I wanted to use here was that you've got um, different shapes, like you've got a circle and a square, and they're, you know, they're different, but they're both polygons, or you know, they're both two-dimensional shapes that you can get the area from. And so we'll create the, you know, create the different objects or classes for them, and with the different uh, required parameters. Um, and, you know, but we'll want to be able to sum up all the areas. So there's different ways we can do this. We can always you know, get the area within the object itself, uh, but then we'll want to probably have another controller or some other code that will be the, the part that sums these two classes together. So on that, we'll create area calculator. So in here, when we want to create it, we're going to inject the, all the different shapes into the construct. Um, and then that way, we'll say that any, all the shapes that are inside of the property shapes uh, will then sum up. And in here for brevity, uh, we have the sum taken out, you know, just kind of missed right here. We'll say that that can either access uh, properties directly from the class or what have you. Uh, then later on, we want to output the data for the client. And so on here, we'll see that we took the different values, we implode the array, so that way it, it concatenates it into a small, uh, you know, minified, so to speak, object, and outputs it as HTML. Now, this, this may be great for meeting the business objective, uh, but at the same sense, the problem that you run into is the, the data is now in HTML. If, if there's anything else that you need to do to manipulate or change it, uh, you're bound to that output. Uh, and that's where you'll see a lot of times you have to uh, read, you know, regular expressions or, or other hacks to get around uh, the, the fact that you had more inline code or more responsibilities in one method or function 
uh, than what was necessary. So you see, all that logic couldn't be held by it, but single responsibility pattern frowns against putting too much inside of one method. Uh, the error calculator should only sum you know, the provided shapes and, and then return something raw, so that way, and then we'll remove the responsibility for displaying it uh, to another either object entirely or to another method or to another helper. So on there, we will now change it to where shapes equals an array of the you know, multiple circles or squares. We'll use the area calculator to come back with the area and then we'll create uh, an output repository in order to then say, we'll move to JSON, you know, YAML, Jade, whatever you need. And now, uh, whenever, you know, whatever logic you need to output the data is in isolation. It's, it's, it's a different responsibility. Uh, and this actually frees you up for doing both a, you know, API as well as full stack development within the same code base without having to copy and paste. Um, you also see that uh, I chose this example because it's very similar to uh, like what you'll see in MVC frameworks. Uh, for example, you'll have the model, the controller, and then, and then you'll want to take that raw data and send it to the view, where all the responsibility for formatting is inside of the view, or uh, rather than inside of the controller, or even worse, inside of the model. Um, and I guess I could stop and ask questions or anything like that, but if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand, but I'm just gonna kinda go through it more quickly uh, for each individual principle. But, the open-close principle, this one took, was a little hard to kind of explain and grasp at, at first, but it says that objects or entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. And this simply means that um, you know, uh, your, your code should be easily you know, extendable without having to modify the class itself. And this is something where even, e even now, you know, when I'm programming, I still run into problems where I've put too much responsibility in the base class or too much responsibility in another piece of code. And then when I say, oh, I'm going to change the technology stack or I need to, I need to uh, be able to handle this new functionality that is a business requirement, I find myself that I am bound to logic that I you know, erroneously or because of speed or, you know, or you know, to get it done, I put it in a class that then extends it. And I was like, well, that, that, that really limited me in the future. So we'll still use our shapes example here. Uh, one is that if we, wanted some, uh, if we wanted the sum method to show all, you know, uh, the area of all shapes or even more shapes, uh, we'd need to add if else blocks. And I'm sure we've all seen code, you know, legacy code where we have to add all these conditionals um, to handle these one-offs because our original code didn't anticipate these new changes to come in. Um, you know, it's like the open close principle is pretty much to say that we can make uh, these sum methods better by removing the logic to calculate the area to each of its individual uh, classes. So that way, the um, so that as you saw in our earlier examples where I had you know for brevity just the sum uh, you know just commented out, we let's say we populated it with this example right here, and then of course, oh well, I got I got a circle, so I needed if a circle do this. Oh, uh, now it's a square. If a square do this. It's like, oh, if, it, if it's this other polynomial or something like that, then we need to do this other, you know, these other formulas. And next, next thing you know, you have a ton of conditionals that really, really limit what you're able to, to do moving forward, and uh, you know, it's more error prone. So by moving that logic into the, into the class or into the object and say, like, this square can return this area, and then that way the the logic to do so is, is encapsulated within the object. It, it's not the responsibility anymore of the, uh, you know, of the area uh, sum class. Uh, it doesn't need, to, care, it doesn't need to, to, to know how it came up with that conclusion. It just needs to know that this is the, the, the correct answer. Um, same thing can be done for the circle class. Um, and now you can sum any shape provided. And if, if a new shape gets inserted that you, you don't even know uh, how, it, how to come up with the area, uh, it is provided by a third party or something like that, you just say, as long as your class can give me, you know, has a method call for area, I will be able to handle it. Um, and that way you can work between multiple teams. Uh, and, you know, and, and again, that your, your class will be usable by other teams as well. Um, 
So you're modular and more reusable. Uh, is that, but you know, here's the other thing is, uh, like I was mentioning, you, you have to be able to trust the data that comes in from this class. Um, you know, how do we know that the object passed to the area calculator is actually uh, a shape or a shape that, that needs to be uh, summed up? Uh, because you, you know, just because it has, this class has area, it may not be of the, uh, of the proper type. Uh, you know. So this is where coding to an interface uh, really comes in, in handy, because then you can actually say that uh, on the top here, that every, every shape, every circle implements the shape interface. And then that way, um, it's bound to this data contract. So then when you go forward and saying it's like, okay, for my service to work for, for doing this, um, I need to have a method called area. And if it, if it doesn't, it's going to brick my system. So by creating this interface, you can then tell to another team or another third-party developer, all right, uh, I need you to, you know, to wrap this up. Get me, get me your, your object and make sure that you adhere to this interface. And if it does, then I know that my code will work. Um, and you'll see many different examples of this in third-party libraries um, and, and uh, payment gateway services. Um, this is also, you know, you'll, I, I use the term a lot, data contract, because it is, it is Im imperative in many different ways to make sure that, uh, uh, that you, when, when you have a service, if you want to have multiple clients be able to use your service, uh, having, a, having a strong data contract uh, is, is a great way to make sure that you're not just bombarded with support calls, the best way to put it. Uh, and this is also where uh, uh, this type of thing is a, is a paradigm that's used in, in RESTful APIs uh, and many, many different services. So if you think about it, that the, um, this principle, uh, you know, open-close principle, is actually used in many different aspects of programming, not just object-oriented code design. So the substitution principle. Um, so functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of der uh, derived classes without knowing it. Um, I guess uh, this is one, I, I don't know how many people know this, but uh, believe it or not, you can actually still pass by reference in, in PHP. It is, um, unless you've dealt a lot with closures or anonymous functions, you probably haven't had to. Uh, but it is still possible to have references in memory uh, that you can use in method calls. And actually, that's also how they manage state with object-oriented design. So one other thing which a lot of developers, when they mi migrate over to uh, using objects for the first time, they're used to an object. Um, if they update it, they still have um, each state on, on procedural code was still, uh, was, uh, what I want to say, still preserved. But in an object, it's actually immutable and a part of that object. So when you, when you update it, you're actually pointing to memory rather than to whatever you, you, you classified. So if you wanted to try to look back in history and you say, I, I, you know, I++, I++, and you're expecting to see like three, four, and five, you know, when you output it, you're actually going to see just five, five, five. Um, sorry, I went off into the weeds there, but it's a little interesting thing about uh, object-oriented design that where this is kind of uh, playing into that. When you point to an object, you're actually pointing to its memory. You're not pointing to the code itself. Um, and we can, we can dive into that a little bit more later. So on here, we have area calculator. Um, and we now want to go even further to look at the volume of objects, maybe going from 2D and 3D. So maybe let's hope that our code will be able to support it. So in here, we want to say, OK, well, volume calculator extends um, you know, the area calculator. We're still going to have like, the same construct. We, we, need to, um, we actually need to inherit the parent construct from area calculator in case we're doing anything inside of the base code. And then we're still going to do our sum. And then you know, our logic to return volume will still be based off of that. So um, right here, you can kind of see that there's there's a possibility for you to you know, keep things ambiguous on here, and there's ways for us to, to help clean that up. Um, so in here, we tried to run an example like this to where we pull in the area calculator um, into, into this, and then we want to return JSON. 
Uh, so in here we call this calculator sum equals this, and then we want to JSON encode it. Um, I, I wish I, I had, you know, in retrospect now looking at this, I'm sure that no one can see the, the error that occurs right here. But uh, when you actually run this, um, you're actually going to get an, a notice. Because the program, the program doesn't necessarily squawk, but when we call it to the HTML method uh, on output, uh, we'll get a notice informing us that the array to string conversion, uh, because we actually had two different data types in there. Uh, again, going back to where we had kind of a loose data contract, and so because um, the area and volume handled it differently, um, it's, you know, our code can be prone, you know, prone to more errors. Um, so to fix volume calculator, uh, we're going to simply, let's see, I have to remember my own slides here, you know, change it, uh, the sum data as a, as a, a double float or integer uh, to make sure that when we, when we pass it, we actually know exactly uh, what, what the method needs to have ahead of time. Uh, and again, this goes back again, like I, I say it 50 times, but a data contract ahead of time saves you a bunch of, uh, infer, you know, a bunch of headaches and, and pain later. Um, and, and it's really hard uh, at first, especially to, to conceptualize it, but, um, and, and it can evolve as time goes on. I mean, there's many times where I'm sure we had to implement something at, at our work where they're like, it needs to do this, this, and this, and we want to use MySQL, or it needs to use Redis, or it needs to use this technology. And you're under so much stress to get it done that when you, when you write it, you, you just decide, I'm just going to write it all in line and get it out there. And I'll, I'll try to fix it later, or I'll try to you know, modularize it later. And then that time never comes. The next thing you know, you end up uh, extending upon these where all of your dependencies and all of your responsibilities are still in inside of this one method. Uh, and then the next thing you know, when, when things start getting a little bit more abstract or features, more features inevitably roll in to extend upon your base code, that's when you get more and more errors and, and you get more and more conditionals inside of it. And the next thing you know, your little 10 line or 20 line method ends up growing to 60 lines, 70 lines, 120 lines for a single method call uh, or for a single function. Uh, and it's just primarily because you're like, man, that, that responsibility uh, probably should have been moved somewhere else. Um, or the other thing is, is I wish I could not have to copy and paste this code over into this new object because it's, you know, it, it's not extensible. I have to do this because I don't know how to reference it um, in another part of the code. So, and, and this is probably my favorite part um, about programming in general, uh, it, whether it's object-oriented or, or not, is the introduction of abstract classes and interfaces. So interface segregation principle is a client should never be forced to implement an interface that doesn't use or, or, or clients shouldn't be forced to depend on methods they do not use. Um, and primarily what that means is, uh, again, going back to the data contract, keep it simple. Uh, when, when you implement, for example, like a, a shopping cart, um, you, you think about uh, what, what is the data contract here for my code? Well, you need to be able to add to cart, you need to view cart, you need to remove from cart. Um, you know, you can think of a pro probably about six different functions that the cart needs to do. And it's like, there's maybe a lot of other features that you can add, or there might be some niche features that you need to do in a particular use case. But when it comes to the, the core of the shopping cart itself, you'll want to keep it to, like I said, to the, the primary methods and functions that every client will use. If, it, if it's, if it's a one-off, it's probably better suited inside of another object or inside of another, another, you know, execution of code. So in, any shape we create, going back to the shape model, is like any shape we create must implement uh, an area and volume method. Uh, and this is what we put into that uh, shape interface that now circle will extend shape interface and you know square will extend shape interface. Um, but uh, we know that squares are flat uh, and don't have volume. So what do we do in this situation? You know, inter you know, there, you know, we can pass null, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, let's see if I can remember my train of thought on here. Uh, in, you know, interface would force square to implement a method it has no use of. Um, so the you know uh, the you know 
interface uh, principle on here uh, would say no to this, that you're not, you know, even though nine times out of 10, maybe volume could be used in this situation, the other 10% will generate errors. Like you have to, again, put conditional logic higher up in your code to say, oh, if volume is null, then let's presume it's a 2D object, not a 3D object. And it's like, oh, this, there's this new, new condition. Well, if else, then, then make sure you do this. And now your, your higher up code is now writing conditional logic based on lower, lo you know, lower level code that ends up becoming a lot harder to maintain. Uh, so instead, you can create another interface called solid shape that uses the volume contract and then solid shapes like, you know, like cu uh, cubes and so forth like that can implement this interface. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, like 2D or 3D. So a much better uh, approach here is now we have two different ones. We have um, the, the, uh, interfa the shape interface and the solid shape interface. Uh, and in this code, actually, this is uh, one where you can um, uh, implement multiple interfaces. This is something that not all languages support uh, as well. Uh, one other example is inside of PHP, you can only extend on one base class. In other languages like C++, um, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you can actually have one class that extends multiple base classes. Um, and some people think this is a really good idea. Other people think it's a really bad idea. I tend to f lean in the latter. Um, and the way that PHP handles it instead is if you, have, if you have a need for having multiple classes that have shared responsibilities, then it's actually not, a, you know, it shouldn't be copy and paste into multiple classes. Uh, PHP actually has a, 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 a new type of uh, object called a trait. And a trait is where you can put many related functions um, into a trait. And then you can say that, OK, both my, my circle and my square and my rectangle all have these common traits. And then that way, instead of having to put them in a base class um, and, then, you know, and then hope that it works in all of them, you can actually start breaking them out into little modular snippets of, of code called traits. So and like I said, this example right here is also really good for managing uh, like a single API endpoint for managing shapes. Um, so we got a managed shape interface where we calculate it. Uh, we've got uh, the square, which still implements the, uh, the shape interface and the managed shape interface. You can do stuff here. Um, and then you can still calculate, we'll still pull stuff from the object itself and then, and then render it. And then this way you have a generic term, calculate, Whereas in some areas, you can say um, if you want the uh, perimeter or circumference, you don't have to. You don't have to have conditional logic that says, uh, you know, if perimeter is null, then presume it's a, a circle, you know, and then grab circumference. By by having it be a generic name or a generic class, you can then have multiple responsibilities or multiple shapes that still return data, uh, legitimate data that is still, uh, you know, meets the the criteria. And then on here, we still say the same thing with, with cuboid. We now have it to where we've got um, you know, the area and volume, and then we calculate. And that way, it doesn't matter what, what object we're really working with. Um, calculate is a generic term that will, re that will return the proper values. Uh-huh. Sure. Oh, sorry about that. This one is the, the shape and, and manage shape interface. It's the new one that got created up here for, for, for Calculate. Oh. And uh, again, this was also for an, um, I tried to make this as generic as possible. Uh, so that's why in here I wanted to mention that proper, the, the proper implementation of this, uh, or I believe the proper Im implementation of this in PHP, is to use these as traits. By making it as a, as a trait, it's a, it's, you can actually just say that this class uses this interface, but it also, you know, on another line, say it uses this trait, and it's the calculation trait, or it's, it's this thing. Um, many, many modern frameworks use that uh, as well, um, both Symfony and Laravel. Yes? It, like the, the relationship between the two classes? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, if, if I'm understanding correctly, like the, the one thing is um, if, if you put uh, too much logic into your base class, uh, then it, you know, it can still work. And it, you know, there's a lot of times where you'll look at your, your parent class and you'll say, it's like, oh, I did all this in, in four lines of code. You know, you're like, so smart, so I'm full of wisdom. And then, but the problem is then when you go through and, and a, new a new feature has to be added, uh, you're saying it's like, oh, well, um, it is all bound in this, in this base class. And with these principles, they say, ideally what you should shoot, shoot for is if you need to change um, something in your in your base class, um, you should hopefully be able to uh, to replace it with a different base class that has the same interface or the same data contract, and your 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 parent class will be none the wiser. Uh, and, and that that's a, like if you think about it, like payment gateways, for example. Um, you want to be able to have, you know, or shopping carts or other ones. That was the original example I used. Um, you want to be keep it to where. Um, it doesn't need to have intimate knowledge of what's happening in the background. The less it knows, the, the better off. I mean, it's, a, it's the practice of least principle to where, you know, you do it for security and hopefully you do it in, in code as well to where, um, like I said, I don't care how you got me this information. All I care about is that, um, you know, that the data contract is valid and that you, you gave me a result. Like, I don't, I don't want to think, don't make me think on how you came up with this number that's your responsibility, not my responsibility. And then by doing that, you can see where you're decoupling your code and making these classes more extendable, and then you're creating little modular packages that could be used through different pieces of your code. Like the buzzword nowadays is microservices, but if you're not careful, you're just creating smaller monoliths. They're, they're, they're still going to be tightly coupled. And the next thing you know, when, when you have another team over here that says, oh, you, you did something that I, uh, that I need to do. 80% of your code is exactly what I need to do. And you go through it, and you realize that, oh, it's all tightly bound to one another. And he says, I can't give it to you. Um, it's, it's tightly bound in, in my code. Uh, so then you have these like, well, I can copy and paste it, but then, then if they sit, you know, then six months later when, you know, your boss says, we need to implement this new feature, you implement it, it works on yours, another team's code broke. And the reason why is because they didn't, they didn't know to copy and paste that line of code. So like I said, the, the, the concept here is, um, is you, you try to make sure, like to overgeneralize it as much as possible, you got to make sure that the separation of concerns and the separation of responsibility is as bound to that object, not it, not its base, you know, base class, or or something else. But you you try to limit it to its scope as much as possible, and then by doing that, it makes it to where you can try to replace its responsibilities if it changes, or or add on to it later on. And one other thing which I didn't get to talk about in here, but it's actually kind of related to the next slide, um, because uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, dependency inversion principle. So this actually ties into this. It's, uh, this one says, enti uh, entities must depend on abstractions, not, uh, not the concentrations. High-level high modules must not depend on the low-level module, but they should depend on abstractions. Um, and that's why, like, if you're depending upon uh, something in your base class, um, that then if you need to replace it for whatever reason or move it over and it doesn't exist, your code's going to break or be, or be error prone. Um, so it's, again, it's easy to, you know, it might sound a little bloated or, you know, uh, but it's actually really easy to understand. It allows for decoupling. Uh, believe it or not, it's actually harder to implement than, you know, than it sounds. Um, but like I said, l um, simple things are worth fighting for. Uh, one other quote, which I don't have in here, is uh, uh, and it's been quoted, you know, in many different iterations. But anyone can make something complex or, or crafty is the term I like to use. Anyone can make something that's like a Rude Goldberg machine, and they like look how complex and awesome this is. Um, but it takes a, a real, a real genius and a little bit of luck uh, to make something very simple. Um, and you and you look as things progress, uh, whether it's code, cars, technology. Um, you'll see that a as things become faster and more efficient and, and cheaper, uh, usually it comes with a simplified process. And our, our code is really no different. Um, so anyways, sorry about that. I go off on tangents a lot. So on here, uh, one, one example that you'll see a lot is the ORMs in, um, in, in, in MVC frameworks. Uh, 
Uh, and this is where, like you said, you'll, you'll create, let's see, like in here, a MySQL connection. And so we're going to throw in our, our DB connection, and it has to be a MySQL connection. Um, and then so in here, um, you know, we'll have a password reminder is, is strictly dependent upon that MySQL connection. Uh, now, but of course in here, that means that um, this dependency is now bound into this code. Um, if for any reason we wanted to rip out MySQL and replace it with Postgres or replace it with some other uh, you know, abstraction layer, this code will break. Um, and again, this is where it violates the principle of dependency inversion. Your dependency should actually be injected or put into your control or into your object, not pulled up from your base class. Um, and it, you know, it's 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 harder to do. Uh, it takes practice. It's the best way to put it. So you know, it's like again, I should have remembered that this was my next slide. Later, if you were to change your database engine, you would also have to edit your password reminder class. Think of all the areas. How many times have you updated code where you have to do a, a search all or like a grep to find all the all the instances of this responsibility? Like the responsibility of connecting to MySQL is now in 30 different places of your code. Um, and then so switching just to Postgres, uh, you know, even if you're using an ORM or or something else, ends up becoming a laborious task or one where if your boss asks you, is, is this you know error free or bug free? Like honestly, I really I hope I caught it all. So on that, the, you know, the open-close principle as well as the dependency inversion principle allows you to move this code and abstract it out into another responsibility. And so in that way, if, if this class uh, uh, is successful, if it doesn't return an error, then you can say with, it, with confidence that these objects are going to work. And the other thing you can say is if these other objects do break for whatever reason, it's most likely a bug in, in the other code in the you know in the you know in when you're bootstrapping your database, not in your individual objects themselves. So it's also easier to find bugs when they do occur as well. Uh, let's see here. So in here, if the interface has a, a connect method, uh, MySQL connection implements the interface. So instead of directly type hinting uh, to the MySQL connection, the class uh, you know, constructor in password reminder will instead. Uh, be bound to an interface. And no matter what database your application uses, a password reminder class can easily connect to the database without any problems, um, and, and the, you know, these principles are not violated. So by doing it here, you'll see that now we've changed it to where we, we are bound to a DB connection interface, uh, which will be the same for if you're connecting to MySQL, Postgres, um, you know, even in some cases, uh, you know, MongoDB, especially for the connection. If you're just connecting to a data repo, that information is pretty, pretty generic. You're either connected or not being able to run queries. So uh, in conclusion, it might seem like a handful at first. Like I know I just probably bombarded you with a bunch of information that is, uh, that is gonna be hard to implement, especially if this is your first time with it. Um, but I, I, tr I hopefully gave some examples to where you can see uh, where this idea uh, is used in, par in other paradigms, like when building a, a, a modern day framework, or, or when you pull in a, a, a package uh, via Composer, how they use interfaces, that way it's easier for you to switch it out, either for your OAuth connection, or for one, one of the packages that I fell in love with early on was Fly System. And Fly System is a way that you can easily switch out where you want to store files. Um, so that means you, you know you can on your local say I want to I'm uh, I'm using Fly System to save and read files. So I'm using the interface to save and read rather than directly doing it myself. And I'm storing it onto my hard disk on my local storage. But then when I go to production, I want it to be on S3. Well, since I'm bound to the interface, it's Fly System save and Fly System read. But then all I have to do is in one config file say that I want you to use S3 instead. And so in one single class, um, in your entire code base, you can switch all of your functionality from saving from, to your local system to S3. And then if you also have one where it says like, oh, in this particular case, we need, to save, we need you to save to Dropbox, and we need this done next week. The cool thing is you just have to create a new interface or, or a new abstraction to the interface to how to connect to Dropbox. And then next thing you know, all, all the code instantly starts saving there because you're bound to the interface. You're saying fly system save, fly system read, and not you know looking on the, you don't have to do 
if if null on localhost, then you know, then look on S3. If null on S3, you know, if else, then look at you know Dropbox. So, uh, like I said, it's it's going to be a little bit of a stretch at first. It was for me as well. Um, and there's still certain things that I'm not a fan of in, in object-oriented design. But in general, the, the solid principle is, is one that I've seen taken on functional programming, procedural programming, uh, you know, uh, many, many different aspects. And you'll see it in, uh, in many different uh, packages that you're going to pull in and, and, and open source projects. And by doing this, it's like, oh, now I understand why this little, this little project that I'm trying to do is actually... 10 different objects or 10 different classes because they want to make sure that when a new feature comes in and my boss wants me to do something, I'll, all I have to do is replace or, or, you know, or extend this, this one little class. I don't have to mull through a bunch of unrelated code or unrelated concerns uh, to get it done. So, sorry, that's my presentation. Hopefully you liked it. If you have any more questions, feel free to, feel free to ask. Nope, okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, how do you balance um, if you have a code base and you know a lot of this and that's in layers and you really want to talk what was going on, but how do you help balance to make sure that uh, solid without making it Oh, so you want to make sure that you're implementing it correctly, not just adding bloat. Yeah, yeah. The, and that's where I said it's going to be a little hard at first, but uh, and it happens a lot, um, a lot when you're when you're first starting. Uh, one example is a few years ago. It wasn't my team directly, but um, they, you know, again, going back to the shopping cart, they were talking about like we're, right now the shopping cart is being stored in in a session, and. Uh, it's not really working out, and so I was actually involved in in a committee to talk about like why we need to move this out. And I say, yes, now we're dependent on this technology stack. If we want to switch to having more microservices or or other other problems, it can't read this. It's in a PHP session. It's power, you know, it, it, it's glued into there. So we need to emancipate the shopping cart and move it to uh, its own repo of some sort or its own data repository. So that part was done, and then it was decided on that it was going to go to, I believe, Dynamo. Uh, was it Elasticsearch? I believe it was first Dynamo, and originally it was first, yeah. So, um, and so when I was talking to the, the developers that were going to implement this, I was inferring pretty heavily um, that uh, the, the make sure that when you do this, you, you make sure that you code the primary functions, like the primary responsibilities first. Uh, and, and once you have that mapped out, uh, then you can add new classes for uh, for the you know how it's implemented. And so what I was saying is like probably the the way that you should go about doing this, or at least if I was doing it, uh, what I would do is I would make an interface first of the responsibilities that you want your shopping cart to complete. And then once that's done, move and migrate your existing session shopping cart to use this new interface. Make sure that you built an, an, an you know, integrally sound interface. And the best way to do it is test it against what you're currently using. Um, and then once that's done, then you just, you know, now you'll have this new object for PHP session. It, you know, like so the, you know, your shopping cart will now use this object for PHP session. And then when you want to switch to Dynamo, you can then Say this shopping cart now uses Dynamo, and then all of your all of your calls like add to cart, remove to cart, you know display cart, so all that still works because you're coding to the interface, and then you can transition from your PHP session to Dynamo, and then later on if it's Elastic Cache or something else like that, you just create a, a third class. Now you have now if you wanted to switch back for whatever reason. It's not like you abandon and orphaned your your code, or you have to dig it out of, of of source control. There are still classes that exist that you can then go back to at any time. So if you went to one and said, "Wow, that that technology stack was not performant at all. Like I did not anticipate that. We need to revert." You know, um, if, if you were to program it all inline or into the functions, you would literally be reverting your code. Um, whereas if you do it in in the responsibility of of, uh, of an object, you can then just switch the object that you use. Um, and again, this is something that is easy to talk about 
when, and also in retrospect, it's very easy to look at it in retrospect. When you're implementing it, it is very, very, very easy for as a developer to say, I can put one line of code right here and, it, and I'll be pretty much done. I can do this in four lines of code right here. And, um, and that's also where you get the term of, of technical debt. So you, you decided to put it on your credit card right then and you'll deal with it later. You'll do it better later. But then as the interest starts piling up and you start putting more debits you know, you know, or more transactions on your credit card, you now have code in many different places that you said I'll get to later. And the next thing you know, the interest on all of that is piling up to where now you're, you're too terrified to touch it. Like I'm sure we all know someone, or we are the type of people that when we get our credit card bill, we're like, I don't even want to look at it. You know, I'm just not, I'm just not even going to bother. I know it's maxed out. I'm just going to do the best I can. And there's a lot of code bases you know, at many, many companies good companies and everything else, where that, that happens. In, in this section, that's like the dead zone. I don't even want to touch it. It just works. Let's leave it. Um, I actually interviewed at a place, I'm not going to say where, but uh, I, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. They, they were a very large company, like hundreds of millions of dollars, approaching a billion dollar company. And they have, <laughs> their production servers are still on PHP 5.3 which has been completely deprecated. Like, it's, it's out of support. And, and, I, and it's, in my head, I was like, one of the things that they always touted about PHP is how easy it is to upgrade. So it's like, and how is this possible? And they didn't give me the specifics, but they're saying that there is too much inline code that calls on stuff that is just deprecated and, or removed from PHP entirely. So there is no, there is no simple path for them to upgrade. Um, Anyways, so I'm sorry, I'm kind of going off on the tangent there, but, but how do you make sure that you're just not creating extra classes just, uh, just to create extra bloat or extra classes? One, if you start looking at your code and you start seeing shopping cart extends a class, which extends a class, which extends a class, which extends a class, you guys is like, oh, you know, I see here where maybe a developer couldn't figure out how to implement exactly what they wanted. So because of a timeline or because they had to hit a, you know, hit a schedule, they just, I'm going to extend it and then just overwrite it. And that's really easy to do in object-oriented design. That's a bad practice to be in. Um, it, I've done it. <laughs> I'm not proud of it. But I've definitely done it myself to where, you know, you've got to, you know, you know. But if you're extending a class because that, you know, using the shapes, I, I couldn't get area to work pro uh, properly in my use case. Or I couldn't get calculate to work right. So I'm just going to extend it. And then I'm just not going to inherit it. I'm just going to completely blow it away and overwrite it in my class. But if you think, if you're on a team of 30 developers and they all took that same approach, the next thing you know, you're going to have a lot of bloat, a lot of extra one-off classes. And then when your boss says, hey, how come it works here but not here? You know, or, or how come you know, we were able to easily change it here but not here? I thought that they shared the same code. It's like, well, they shared the same code, but it was copy and pasted three years ago. You know, a lot of things have changed since then. Um, so it, it definitely takes some practice. It definitely takes some mind thought, but the main thing is like imagine your code being um, like a security guard, and you want to make sure that that anyone, uh, all of your code and all of your classes and all of your functions has the minimal responsibility possible, like the, on a need to know basis. And if that's the case, they do one job and do that one job well, because the last thing you want is your code to ha do one job well and then take on multiple hats and then kind of do it well or or, you know, or fail sometimes. Uh, and break it out. And again, I'll, I'll try to wrap that up by also saying, like, um, analogy I also like using is I think that as of now, you know, programming has become a lot more mature. I'm doing it now for, you know, programmers have been around for about 70 years now. It's still a relatively young profession, but I, I like to think that we're on the cusp of, uh, like, the coding version of the industrial revolution. And we're trying to find new names for it, like solid, microservices, micro packages. But in inevitably, it all comes down to the same thing, just interchangeable parts. Try to build interchangeable parts, whether it's object-oriented, whether it's a, a single in, single out function, uh, you know, or you know, anything like that. Just try to create interchangeable parts. And if, and if you strive for that, then, then you'll find out that you're on the industrial revolution. You're going to be able to streamline much more processes faster and easier with, with less errors. So, sorry. Any other, any other questions or comments or concerns? All right. <laughs>